Hello, I am Joshua P. Warren, and this is Joshua P. Warren Daily. And we have a lot of new listeners to this podcast, in part because of all the new media attention that I've been getting this year so far, such as my appearance on the Discovery Channel. And I'm receiving a lot of messages from people who are saying, okay, now that the government has released these UFO videos and verified that these things are real, these UFOs are real, what are these things like what because there are people who've said i've always sort of like you know half listened to this stuff i know you talk about it now they're ready to listen and plus the world's in such a weird state so i have people who are coming to me saying all right my ears are open my mind is open what are those things that are flying around so i'm going to tell you based upon everything that I've learned up to this point, what I think those things are that you see flying around. And uh, some of this you may have heard already, some of it you may not have heard or haven't thought about. So I, I've finally decided to go ahead and lay this out for you based upon all my years of work. Before I do that, I want to also reiterate that today is the first full day of everything open in phase one here in Las Vegas, Nevada. That means you can go to a restaurant and sit down and eat like a civilized person. You can go to a, a retail store and buy things that are non-essential. You can go to um, the barber shop or the salon. There are lots of things you can do like you used to do back in the good old days. Now, of course, um, you still have to adhere to social distancing and some you know limited capacity things like that still can't open bars or entertainment venues that's down the road but today people seem to be in a pretty good mood here even though it's a hundred degrees and that's nice to know you know uh, recently lauren and i were at the grocery store here in las vegas and as we were walking down an aisle i i looked and there was this uh, you know pretty young woman looked like she was in, in her 20s, uh, just walking back the other way, wearing a t-shirt that said, fuck you, you fucking fuck. And I thought to myself, why would you wear that? Like, seriously, like, why would you wear a t-shirt out in public that says, fuck you, you fucking fuck? Now, I mean, I look, I, I get the humor there, trust me, I get the humor. But still, I mean... When you wear something like that out in public, what kind of a reaction do you expect to get? Like what? I don't. I don't know. I don't know what goes on in in, in a person's mind who who puts something like that on a T-shirt and just parades out there in public. Uh, it's very very weird to me, and, and it's almost like we know that everybody's in kind of a tense state right now, and. Um, so, look, maybe, again, maybe this is just her trying to be funny, but uh, <laughs> I, it's not, I would not recommend wearing such apparel out in public now. So, hopefully, uh, well, I guess she was maybe trying to nip some things in the bud there, perhaps, but hopefully now everybody is going to start feeling a little bit better and more open as we start uh, getting back into this non-isolated lifestyle. And yes, I understand we will have a spike in new cases, but um, there's no way around that. That's just gonna happen. There's, it's, you know, there's, you can't stop that. So um, anyway, look, I'm happy that things are starting to get, to get back to normal. And if you have a wishing machine or access to a wishing machine and you are in one of these places in our world that is still under a strict lockdown, then you better use that machine and try to open things back up and create opportunities for yourself. I got an email from a guy who said, what if you have a wishing machine and you want to wish for something for yourself, but that thing cannot come true until everything opens back up again? And I said, well, take it one step at a time. First, set your machine to get things open and then you reset it and then you work on what you want to do when it's open you take it you know just like anything else one step at a time as you work towards your goal so anyway let's get to this big question all right we've had these well there's been a ton of ufo footage out there forever but just recently 
some of the more credible sources, you know, which is weird, you know, like the Navy and the Pentagon, places like that, uh, they are they're admitting, well, okay, this stuff is real now, and but we've known that forever, right? And in fact, I posted a meme on my Facebook page the other day. It was it, I didn't come up with it. It was one of those things I just shared that somebody else had. It's a meme, and it has a little still from that footage you've seen a million times of that craft from uh, outside the windshield of the fighter jet. And the meme says, "2020 is so wild." that the government just confirmed UFOs are real, but no one cares. And interestingly enough, I got some comments um, from people who seemed like they were a little miffed. They were saying like, well, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> they didn't understand like this is supposed to be, you know, kind of humorous and tongue in cheek. 2020 is so wild that the government just confirmed UFOs are real and that in other words there's so much going on it doesn't have the same impact as it might have had otherwise but it is funny isn't it how that something like this as big as this sort of slipped open under the radar uh, I, I I watched um, Dr. Stephen Greer's new movie I think I watched it on Amazon and it's called um, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. Very good movie. I recommend you watch it. And of course, like a close encounter of the first kind is when you, you see a UFO. And then the second kind is when there's some kind of physical evidence. Maybe there's charred ground or something like that. And the third kind is when you have contact. And then the fourth kind is if you're abducted. And then the fifth kind, according to Dr. Greer, is where um, you're sort of like, uh, let's see, I'm not sure how you put it, but it's almost like you are, are, you're telepathically merging with them on a spiritual level of peace or something like that, a transcendent level. I don't know exactly how he worded it, but you get it. You know, it's like, oh, we're, we're reaching out to be buddies now or something like that. Maybe that's maybe it's like human initiated contact, something like that. So anyway, you just gotta watch the movie Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. So what do I think these things are? For one thing, uh, the universe is such a vast, mysterious, complex place that I believe that there are multiple types of things flying around out there that we call UFOs. They're not all the same. But I do think that most of what we see flying around are not machines with a little green man sitting inside at the steering wheel. I do think that that exists out there. And if you are to believe some of the stuff that people like Bob Lazar have said, he basically says that these are machines that were built for childlike sized you know, beings with their control panel. So, you know, I'm sure that is out there. But those things, they have more of a, a defined structure to them. And a lot of these UFOs that you see flying around and video much more often, um, they, they do not have such a fixed shape. They almost seem to be capable of sort of shape shifting a little bit in order to perhaps just adjust to the ever-changing environmental conditions as they are soaring around our atmosphere. And before I get into to what I believe, I want to read this, um, a bit of this article to, to you because this will certainly apply. Um, let's see, Elon Musk sat down, of course, he's into everything now. Uh, the, he's got these SpaceX Starlink satellites zooming around. Uh, he's getting ready to shoot Tom Cruise up to outer space. He is working on brain implants. Of course, he's got his cars out there. And Elon Musk sat down with Joe Rogan, and they talked about the future of AI, artificial intelligence, and its role in the symbiosis of man and machine. And 
Musk revealed, according to Futurism.com, that he co-founded this startup called Neuralink, and they are close to putting some type of an implant into a human brain. He says, quote, we may be able to implant a neural link in less than a year in a person, I think, end quote. Uh, back in July of 2019, the company showed off plans to shoot holes in subjects' skulls with lasers and feed flexible threads of electrodes into their brains. So Musk said that what they're going to do here is remove a piece of the human brain that's about one inch in diameter in order to insert some kind of an implant. And he says that he thinks it's going to be very safe, of course, very low potential for risk for rejection of the body. And uh, he said, quote, people put in heart monitors and things for epileptic seizures, deep brain simulation, artificial hips and knees, that kind of thing. And uh, he said, it's well known what is cause for a rejection or not, end quote. So what's the purpose of these? What, is, what are these things going to do? Well, here's what he's saying so far. It's a little bit hazy, uh, a little general. He says, he likened the process of his neural stimulation device zapping the brain to, quote, kicking a TV, end quote. He said, while that sounds violent, the goal is to restore brain functionality. For instance, those with Alzheimer's could have their memories restored. Quote, it's like a bunch of circuits and those circuits are broken, Musk explained. So surely they're gonna do something more refined than that, but that's apparently what he said. He says, there's still a lot of work to do. And then um, they started talking about this idea of humans merging with machines. And Musk said, quote, we are already a cyborg to some degree. You got your phone, you got your laptop. If you're missing your phone, it feels like missing limb syndrome, end quote. And you know, he's right about that. And that is something that I have talked about myself when I'm describing radionics and wishing machines and stuff like that. I've said that I believe that these are bits of technology that somehow become an extension of yourself. And that sure enough, if you are sitting down at a table and you put your cell phone down somewhere at a restaurant, subconsciously, you know exactly where that phone is. It's, it's like some kind of invisible appendage is attached to that thing. Even though there's no physical connection, you're still you know, intellectually, even spiritually attached to that thing. And that whole thing has your life on it. A representation of your life is in the data on that phone, which is why if somebody steals your phone, it's a very scary thing. They could do a lot of damage if your phone is not properly secured. So uh, anyway, people have been cyborgs for a long time. I mean, all a cyborg really is, is a merging of some type of what we consider inanimate material, like a non-living thing with the living body. So if somebody has a heart attack and they get a stent to put in, well, guess what? You're a cyborg. You could even make the case that, well, you know, when you had, if you had a tooth filled and they put some substance in there, you know, they used to put in metal for tooth fillings, you're a cyborg then. Um, it's reinforcing or enhancing the human body in some way with something that you weren't born with, basically. Something that's not organic, as we think of organic. And right now, we are in the earliest stages of this as a civilization, as a society. Because when, when, you, when you jam some piece of metal, some piece of titanium into your body or whatever, it, you know, it, it may work seamlessly with your body, but it sticks out like a sore thumb. And eventually we'll get to the day when we're similar to the characters in Star Wars. You know, Darth Vader over the years, he got this arm cut off and then this lead cut, cut off and then he got burned here and he got, and the next thing you know, Darth Vader is not much more than just like a head and a spine, but they kept building up this 
body around him, and so he's pretty much like a big metal badass with this little human somewhere inside. And um, we are going to get to that point eventually. If we don't destroy ourselves and we keep developing technologically, there will come a day when you're going to meet people who are more or less a brain in a really fancy jar. And there are going to be all kinds of interesting implications that come from that. But I guarantee you it's going to happen. It might be a thousand years before that happens. Probably not. Probably not. But I'm just saying, eventually it will happen. Um, but, okay, let's imagine in a thousand years uh, you have all these like mechanical people running around. And these are people who would have been dead ordinarily. But now they've been alive like 400 years or whatever. Um because every time something breaks down, they just replace it. You can imagine that. You can definitely imagine that. What you can't imagine, however, is how that same trend would look uh, if it continued at that same rate if you were looking at a society or a civilization that is a million years ahead of us. You probably don't even have to go that far, but let's do it. Let's say a million years ahead of us. You are probably at that point going to end up with life forms that are a seamless combination of what we think of as organic and inorganic material. And so it has properties of both. It is a form of life, but it's not exactly life as we know it here because we're still trying to dice everything up and categorize and, car and compartmentalize everything. Whereas a million years in the future, they are so seamlessly merged into one thing that this thing has majestic looking powers. You know, it can fly around um, just like, you know, an airplane or something, but it doesn't have a little pilot inside it. It has its own consciousness. And this started becoming more and more apparent to me when I was living in Puerto Rico, studying all of the UFO activity down there. And I'm telling you, if you have not watched this short film that I made, it took me four years of research to put this together. And even if you've watched it before, go back and watch it again now with this new footage that you're seeing. Watch it, you know, and look back at, uh, well, anyway, if you go to my website, joshuapwarren.com, joshuapwarren.com, the video I want you to see there is only probably about 15 minutes long. It may be not even that, I can't remember. When you go to joshuapwarren.com, there's a section on the menu there called Gallery of the Strange. Now, when you click that, there's a lot of cool stuff there I mean, you can get lost in all these different subjects. And again, it's not the best organized thing because I just, you know, I'm always in a hurry and I just kind of add stuff to it as, it as it pops up over the years. But when you're looking at these subjects underneath Gallery of the Strange, you'll see a heading there and it says O-U-F-O's. Just like the word UFOs, except there's an O in front of it. O-U-F-O's. Organic UFOs Report. You'll see, that's all it says. O U F O S colon organic U F O S report. Click that link. When you do that, a, a whole page is going to pop up with a video. The video is there. You can watch it through either YouTube or Vimeo. There is a supporting uh, scientific paper there. It's a PDF. There is a press release there. And watch this video. And you will see that when I was in Puerto Rico, I was documenting these things that were flying around Puerto Rico that don't look like your just classic silver flying saucer. They, they look a little different, okay? There's something different about the way they, they look and they move. And then, of course, I was amazed to, to look back and find that thousands of years ago, the natives who lived on that island called the Taino Indians, they worshipped these deities that looked almost just like the stuff we see there today flying around. They're called Sami, 
C-E-M-I, the Semis, and they considered them to be, quote, lesser gods. And the Semi would fly around, and they were telepathic, and uh, the the Semi, uh, well, they, well, they used to make all kinds of little statues of them. You can find these Semi statues all over Puerto Rico. There's even a museum there in a town called Hoyoya, uh, which... It's called the Museum of the Semi, and I went to that museum, and you get to see these ancient artifacts there as a part of the video. But in this short film, which again, this is four years worth of, of work, I was documenting, you know, not only was I documenting what the, the locals were, were seeing there, and you get to see pictures and video. Also, while I was there, Homeland Security captured this amazing thing flying around the Aguadilla Airport. Um, I even did my own experiment where I was able to go out and call down one of these things and get footage of it shooting down to my camera and shooting back off into the sky. And I, after showing all this footage, and some of it is just earth shattering, I, for some reason, a lot of people did not really pay that much attention to this when I released it. Maybe now they will. But furthermore, um, it, I, I had, of all places, some footage that did make the mainstream news in Denver, Colorado, where very similar things had been seen flying around. And I show that as well to indicate this is not something that's exclusively related to Puerto Rico. And the conclusion that I came to was that these UFOs are so mysterious to us they're so weird to us they're so foreign to our way of thinking because they are not just sophisticated machines they are sophisticated cyborgs that these represent a form of life that is not restricted to the evolution of apes okay they you don't end up needing two arms and two legs and all this stuff and a hairy chest and whatnot. You don't need all that stuff eventually if you learn how to make your own body. And when you, when you start learning how to make your own body, you start making it more and more comfortable and efficient and more goal oriented. So if you want to spend all your time in the water, you're going to make your body uh, suitable. You know, you're going to improve your body and, and have it match that environment a little more. Or if you want to spend your time flying around in the sky, you're going to match that environment. If you want to explore the inner earth, you're going to match that environment. That these beings can sort of customize their bodies. And one of the things that's so fascinating about them, which you can see from the movie I did, where you have these Tainos to this day, the descendants of the Tainos who claim that you can go out and telepathically communicate with them and make them appear, which is exactly what I did and captured on video. But it, that's the same thing that Dr. Stephen Greer is talking about in his movie Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, that whatever these are, they are conscious, sensitive beings. And that what, what this means is if you go out there and you telepathically project an invitation to them, somehow they can sense that. They can pick that up because they are living things with this perfectly designed, seamless, you know, shape-shifting, uh, inorganic shell as well, okay? I mean, it, it's, it's hard to put this stuff into words. Let me, okay, let me give you a scenario. Let's say you are walking on a trail through the woods and you happen to look down and glance an ant crawling along. Now, for one thing, you probably wouldn't even ever see that ant, but if you did see the ant, chances are you would just keep on walking. But what if you look down and there was a big circle of ants and they're all moving around in a circle? Well, you might stop at that point and pay attention to them and say, what are those ants doing? That's really weird. I wonder what they're up to. But now imagine if those ants 
spelled out your name. They're, they're arranged with the letters to, to represent the letters of your name. Oh, what the hell? Okay, now this is a big thing. You're going to get down on your knees and you're going to pay attention to these ants and you're going to take pictures of them and you're going to say, holy shit, these ants are trying to communicate with me. So when you have these sessions, when people were trying to attract a UFO, maybe one person can go out there and meditate and have some success. But it seems to be most successful when you have a group of people who come together. And they don't always have to be at the same place at the same time. Um, what we did in Puerto Rico was an example of broadcasting uh, an invitation through through radio waves and radionics. That's a whole different conversation. But if you get a group of people out in the field and they're all sitting there and they're like-minded and they're sending out this invitation, then you're much more likely to catch the attention of one of these things because they are another form of life. And maybe calling them organic UFOs was not the best term because that may make them sound like I'm saying they're just a big blob of flesh or they're a big bug or something. No, I'm saying that they are they're more than just a machine. It's more like an artificial intelligence organic UFO, okay? It's more like that. I don't know how you put all these things into a nice little easy to describe phrase or term, but this is why these things are so weird and this is why it, we have such difficulty understanding them. I believe what we are seeing here is a living machine that is from a civilization that is way, way more advanced than we are and has been evolving far, far longer. Are they from another planet? Probably. Um, but at this point, you could say if time and space are connected and these things are traveling through the universe because they're manipulating wormholes or something like that, then it may be that you could just as easily say they're from another dimension because to say something is another planet might just be a localized term. We're talking about a bigger idea that they're, wherever they were born, they ended up being able to travel through space time and dimensions in a way in order to get here. So it's best just to say, where are they from? They're from elsewhere. How you define elsewhere depends on your relative position, your relative point of view. If you're in their neck of the woods, it might just be another rock. Yes, they're from a planet. But compared to our planet, they're probably from another dimension as well as another rock. And are you with me? Or is this too... I mean, I, I get it if this is too bonkers. But hey, you asked me to explain. Some of you did anyway. I know it's a complex subject. That is why we don't have a nice, simple, easy answer for what these things are. So I call them OUFOs just to distinguish them from the very generic term UFO because a UFO is simply an unidentified flying object. It could be anything. Just because you can't identify it doesn't mean someone else can't. I mean, a UFO to you might be a very well-known type of helicopter to some guy who's in the military. It's not unidentified to him. So I came up with OUFO to distinguish it, to, to be a little more specific about the types of things that we see flying around Puerto Rico and the Bermuda Triangle and Denver, Colorado, and some of this kind of stuff that these pilots are capturing flying around the Pacific Ocean and Catalina Island. All this stuff to me looks more like what I would consider to be an OUFO. Now granted, some of the military stuff does look a little bit more structured, but that's not to say these things don't have uh, a fixed shape. It, it just means that that shape can shift. It's not as rigid as the shape of the craft that we humans are making right now. So that's what I think we're looking at. We are looking at a conscious machine, a uh, symbiosis 
of organic and inorganic material creating a cohesive advanced life form that is flying around this planet doesn't usually care about us I don't know what they're up to but occasionally they they take an interest in us and occasionally we take an interest in them and there's some kind of contact will it go any further than that I don't know but we have to ask ourselves if indeed it is possible that sometimes one of these craft decides that they don't like us and uh, and zaps us. You know, is there a danger there? You know, the Space Force just released their first recruiting uh, video. If you haven't seen it, you can go to uh, my Twitter, at Joshua P. Warren, at Joshua P. Warren, and find it. Or you can just, you can go to YouTube and type in Space Force recruitment video, but you're, you're going to see a lot of parodies out there already. So just make sure that you're looking at the real one. The real one is 30 seconds long. It's released by the military. If you want to get the real one, go to at Joshua P. Warren or just go to you know, twitter.com slash Joshua P. Warren. And remember, if you don't know anything about Twitter, you don't have to join Twitter or sign up or anything just to go look at somebody's Twitter page. You could just type in Joshua P. Warren in Twitter and my Twitter page will come up. It's just, for you, it's just like a web page and you can go there and you can scroll through all my little tweets, my little posts, and you can see everything and click everything. So some people have said, look, uh, Reagan back in the 80s, he's, he came up with the whole Star Wars thing, uh, the Star Wars project. For those of you who are really young listening to the show, I'm not talking about the movie. I'm talking about a project that President Ronald Reagan came up with. It's, it was basically a secret uh, space agency with a lot of, uh, it was called like a strategic, it was, it was a strategic missile defense system or something like that. I, Star Wars, it had, it's one of these acronyms, but it was, it was all about putting secret shit in space that we could use to zap other people's satellites and missiles and all that. And that, and he, of course, he made that speech where he said something to the effect of, wouldn't we all unite as a world if we were fighting one common enemy, some alien force? You know, he made that statement. I'm sure you've heard that or seen that on TV many times. And so he was looking at it, perhaps, from just a truly a defensive standpoint as if there is some potential for, for warfare. And now you have even Senator Harry Reid who, of course, was collecting all of these pieces of debris for the ATIP project. And what was he doing? He was turning around and writing a letter to the Department of Defense saying, we need an extra level of classification on this because this could be used for incredible weaponry. And if this fell into the hands of our, um, you know, our adversaries, that this would be disastrous. So they're always thinking about the possibility of some kind of warfare here. And a lot of people believe it is possible that the Tunguska explosion was an example of some type of an alien attack or, or an alien shooting a little warning or just target practicing or whatever, seriously. Now, of course, Tunguska... The Tunguska event happened on June 30th of 1908. This was way out in the middle of nowhere in Russia. And all of a sudden, you know, at, late at night, there was this unbelievable explosion. And it was in such a remote place. Um, fortunately, I don't think anybody was killed. Uh, but, you know, isn't that interesting? that it just so happened to be in a remote place, which almost makes you think that it was intentionally done in a place where it wouldn't harm humans. Because this explosion, it wiped out 80 million trees over an area of 830 square miles. But the weird thing is, there was no crater. Nobody has been able to explain what caused this. There have been lots of theories, but nobody knows. Every theory has a hole in it. Every theory has been shot down. One thing I'll tell you that I find kind of eerie is that 
if you really use your imagination on this, this is a little creepy. I was talking recently in a podcast about how before some kind of terrible event happens, that people will often see these winged beings, beings that look sort of like butterflies or moths. So you have Mothman in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, before the collapse of the Silver Bridge. You have the Gargula, which looks like this big winged gargoyle flying around Puerto Rico before all the bad stuff happens there. Throughout history, you have these winged beings sometimes described as angels or demons that are seen in areas just before something major and often disastrous occurs. And when you look at the blast pattern of the Tunguska event, it's shaped like a giant butterfly. I don't know. It, 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 if you watch the movie The Mothman Prophecies, which is one of my favorites, the book is fantastic by John Kill. If you're into this weird stuff, you got to read that book. But the movie is, you know, the movie is not like the book, but the movie is... is creepy it'll make your skin crawl in a different way especially if you watch it late at night by all by yourself okay uh in the dark do it that way late at night all by yourself in the dark watch the mothman prophecies it's got richard gear in it and uh this is like the whole theme is like what is it what's up with these these winged beings that play this role that we can't understand in our lives and then, of course, I read about Tunguska, and they said butterfly-shaped blast pattern. It's, I don't know, it's creepy to me. It's like one of those Rorschach tests that uh, you keep seeing this butterfly pattern pop up all throughout the history of these, like, eerie paranormal experiences. And ugh. By the way, do you know even though this happened in a remote area, there were some witnesses who gave some accounts of what they saw. Now, the reason I'm bringing this story up is because there is a brand new news story. Some scientists have a new theory about what created the Tunguska event. I'm going to tell you what that theory is in a minute. But first, if you've never uh, encountered any of these witness reports, let me uh let me read one or two for you. Um this is the testimony of a man named S. Semenov, and it was recorded in nineteen thirty by a meteorologist named Kulik who was on an expedition. Here was the testimony of this man who lived close enough to experience the outskirts of the Tunguska explosion. He said, and this is verbatim, at breakfast time, I was sitting, so I guess this happened, you know, real early in the morning. I said at night, but I guess it's real early in the morning. So he says, at breakfast time, I was sitting by the house at Vanavara Trading Post. And by the way, that's about 40 miles south of the explosion facing north. He said, I suddenly saw that directly to the north over Tunguska Road, the sky split in two and fire appeared high and wide over the forest. The split in the sky grew larger and the entire northern side was covered with fire. At that moment, I became so hot that I could not bear it, as if my shirt was on fire. From the northern side where the fire was came strong heat. I wanted to tear off my shirt and throw it down. But then the sky shut closed, and a strong thump sounded, and I was thrown a few meters. I lost my senses for a moment. But then my wife ran out and led me to the house. After that, such noise came as if rocks were falling or cannons were firing. The earth shook, and when I was on the ground, I pressed my head down, fearing rocks would smash it. 
when the sky opened up, hot wind raced between the houses, like from cannons, which left traces in the ground like pathways, and it damaged some crops. Later we saw that many windows were shattered, and in the barn a part of the iron lock snapped. Wow! Isn't that something? And, and this is very similar, like if you look at all these um, and, and you know, all the, the, everybody kind of says the same thing. There was a huge big fire, thunderclaps, shock wave that came through, knocked people down. In, in one village it says that women were running and screaming, believing it was the end of the world. So what was that? It took scientists a long time to even get there. And when they got there, they said, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. There's no impact crater here of any kind. They estimate that just that shock wave that that guy said knocked him down would have been a 5.0 on the Richter scale. They say the energy of this thing may have been 30 megatons of TNT. And that an explosion of that magnitude would be capable of destroying a large metropolitan area. Since 1908, there have been over 1,000 scholarly papers published about this explosion. A team of researchers published the results of an analysis of micro samples from a peat bog near the center of the area, which show fragments that may be of meteoric origin. And of course, you've had people say, could this have been a comet? And that's why we don't have an impact crater that, you know, it, it was too soft. And then you have people who say this was Nikola Tesla and he was trying out his death ray and uh or somebody working with him was trying out the death ray or that a ufo crashed or ufo zapped us like you you've got all these theories here's the latest scientific theory this was published um well i, I saw this first reported through the coast to coast am website an intriguing new theory has been offered for what caused the legendary 1908 tunguska event Scientists studying the strange incident in which a mysterious blast of some kind flattened a whopping 80 million trees over an area of 830 square miles in Siberia have long suspected it was caused by a meteor striking the Earth. However, a recently published paper reportedly calls that hypothesis into question and instead put forth a rather fantastic alternative explanation. Siberian scientists studying the case argue that the Tunguska event was actually the result of a sizable iron asteroid entering the Earth's atmosphere, skimming the planet, and then shooting back out into space. The bold idea was based on mathematical models which explored different scenarios wherein asteroids of varying size, composition, and trajectory interacted with the Earth. Through this process, researchers were able to rule out an icy ball and a rocky object as the culprits for the blast, and in turn determined it was most likely an iron asteroid. The model which best matched what occurred in 1908 indicated the iron interloper was approximately 320 to 650 feet in diameter and zipped across 1800 miles of the Earth's atmosphere before exiting back into space. This brief moment, researchers say, would generate the force seen on the ground in Tunguska and explain why there is, why there is no crater that can be connected with the event. The scientists behind the paper also noted that the theory accounts for, quote, optical effects associated with the strong dustiness of high layers of the atmosphere over Europe, which caused a bright glow of the night sky, end quote. So what do you think about that? That's some crazy stuff to think about, that 
a giant asteroid would have hit the Earth at just the right angle, it would be almost like a rock skipping off the surface of a pond. That it hit the Earth and then bounced and shot right back off into space. And to this very day, may be continuing its journey out there across the cosmos with some Russian pine trees stuck to it. Does that make sense? I don't know. I mean, I guess if you look at sort of a butterfly pattern, it kind of makes sense that like it would come in, you know, broad, hit right in the middle and then bounce back out and you'd have kind of like, you know, I guess a wing pattern where it came in and made contact and then flew back out. I don't know. It's probably one of the more plausible theories. But, I, you know, I haven't studied that enough to really come up with uh, anything better. Uh, I mean, I've just read the same stuff everybody else has. I've never been to Russia, and I, I don't think I'd want to go out and do that. I mean, that's uh, that's a... They say when you go up there, for one thing, it's it's so snowy and icy. There's only a certain small window of time in, like, the spring and summer when you can go up there, and you're sort of wading through mud. It's the tundra, you know. You're wading through mud that can be, you know, waist high, and there are just clouds and clouds of mosquitoes attacking you the whole time. Very, very unpleasant area. So I don't know. Um, maybe that's what it is. Interesting to think about. Or maybe we'll see something like this happen again soon. Because maybe there is some kind of a war brewing here between ourselves and the extraterrestrials. And some have been speculating that this lockdown we're going through is a test of just how compliant people are going to be when that truth is revealed and uh, how panicky they're actually going to be. Seems to me that people have minded quite well, though. I mean, you know, you see these protests on TV, but most people seem to be doing exactly what they're told by the government. So... I don't think the government's too worried at this point about us uprising. People have gotten too fat and lazy and used to convenience and too sensitive for that sort of thing. So this could be part of the plan, uh, easing us in, easing us in to exactly what the implications are behind having the space force and the possible conflicts that we may have with these other beings, which of course is exactly what Dr. Stephen Greer says is wrong and terrifies him the most, that there's no reason for us to have that demeanor, that if these aliens wanted to harm us, they would have done so already a long time ago. That's what he believes. Who knows? Well, I told you that I have one more little batch of the Forces of Nature Magnet Wand available again, and man, boy, did you respond. We got a big surge of orders on those things. I think we still have some left, though, in this batch. If you're interested in the Forces of Nature Wand, handmade right there in my workshop, you'll find nothing else like it anywhere else in the world. Go watch the video about it. Go to joshuapwarren.com click the link to the curiosity shop there and scroll down and just read about it. Even if you don't plan to buy anything, just watch the video and learn about it and all the other stuff that's there. You won't find anywhere else in the world. We, we are currently sold out of some things. We're sold out of Shelly Wright's money potion. Uh, we'll see if we get some more of that in at some point. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to keep everything as in stock as possible. We've had a lot of interest, a lot of demand, a lot of people out there doing experiments and it's just wonderful to hear from them. I'll, I'll read some testimonials for you uh, again soon in an upcoming podcast. Also, I decided in the middle of this um, pandemic situation, I figured I was going to take this as an opportunity to make something I've been wanting to make probably for close to 20 years. An item that I wanted to make, a metaphysical item that I wanted to make just for me, one of a kind. So I sat down and I designed this thing and I got a hold of a company and had them manufacture it for me. 
and they sent it to me and I've been using this and I love it so much that I've decided that I'm going to share this with you and soon um, probably within the next 30 days I'm going to tell you what this is because I decided this is such a specialized product I'm not going to put it in my curiosity shop I'm just going to make one batch just for those of you who are into this stuff who really like to follow my work who really support the stuff that I do um, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say okay here's what this is I'm going to show you a video and tell you about it and say if you want one put in your order right now and I'm going to go make this batch and that's it so I'm, I'm literally going to take your order before the batch is made because I'm only going to make one batch just for those of you who want it so stay tuned I'll be telling you right now I'm the only person in the whole wide world who has this thing I've got it right now as we speak it's touching my flesh um, but soon yes I will let you know when I have decided to make that other well this batch it's, it's going to be the only batch I make so when you're there at joshuapwarren.com be sure you sign up for the free e-newsletter that's how I can contact you and keep you informed directly put in your email address takes you two seconds hit the button you'll get a free instant good luck charm and also once you get the confirmation that you're subscribed to my e-newsletter add me to your contacts there to your address book to make sure that when I send out an e-newsletter it doesn't end up somehow in your spam folder or something like that uh, that's important because uh, you know right now all these email services they have all these different new ways of trying to filter out garbage so make sure you add me to your address book joshuapwarren.com while you're there click around enjoy all the strange stuff um, again go to the gallery of the strange look at the OUFOs organic UFOs report go to the curiosity shop uh, I have a really busy week coming up I'm going to be getting on an airplane and flying off to do another television show so I'll tell you as much as I can about that as things proceed but oh it's going to be a heck of a week um, all right my friends that is it for today's podcast I hope that you are doing well you're hanging in there you're manifesting a better world for yourself trust me it works you just got to take it seriously and you can make it work quickly you can change things quickly for yourself so thank you for listening if you go there to joshuapwarren.com click the link to this podcast called Joshua P Warren daily you can subscribe through various means or just follow me on Twitter at Joshua P Warren at Joshua P Warren and I will usually tweet when a new one is available oh and by the way soon I'm gonna give away a hundred dollars for free um, if you're a subscriber to my free e-newsletter what I'll do is I'll send a newsletter out and I'll say the first person who replies to this gets a hundred dollars I've done this before I'm about to do it again so sign up now that your heads up if you're not a member of my e-newsletter sign up now and I might just do the same thing with my Twitter we'll see uh, anyway Joshua P Warren.com gives you access to all that thank you for listening thank you for your interest and support thank you for staying curious and I will talk to you again soon <laughs>